I know some people are on. Can you hear me? And uh, can you type responses? Facebook has changed the out the layout a bit here. Thank you, John. All right, thank you both. I'm trying to they change the Facebook producer uh, program. Hi, Maureen. Good to see that you're here.
We have a few more minutes. Uh, we'll let some more people log on. Hi, Barbara. Welcome. We'll give another minute or two. I do encourage you uh, on the, uh, depending on how you've got it showing on your screen, but uh, share this with your feed uh, so that others might see it, might happen upon it. Um, and yeah, and then we'll take another moment or two and then we'll take a moment for prayer. Okay, why don't we just take a moment and uh, begin with prayer. Um, today is the uh, memorial of Our Lady of Sorrows, the seven sorrows of Mary, those moments when her suffering with her son uh, became most pronounced. And in that suffering, she encountered her son, we through her encounter that uh, that the divine gift of a suffering God, and then we through her find our way to hand to receive that to handle that with great serenity. Um, at at St. Monica Parish, one of my two parishes, uh, we have a beautiful uh, I think it's one third scale statue of the Pietà, uh, where where Mary is holding the lifeless, the, the crucified body of her son, but her countenance, her face is just amazingly serene. 
And that is in front of the windows, which represent the seven sorrows of Mary. And if you go to the St. Monica Parish website, which would be saint-monica.org, and you go into the prayer, you can actually uh, see and pray through the stained glass windows of the seven sorrows of Mary, the chaplet of Our Lady of Sorrows. And we have a beautiful, some parishioners did a great job properly photographing and then laying out for prayer, and you can scroll through each one. So I just want to use the closing prayer from the chaplet of the seven sorrows of Mary. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let intercession be made for us, we beseech you, O Lord Jesus Christ, and at the hour of our death, before the throne of your mercy, by the Blessed Virgin Mary, your mother, whose most holy soul was pierced by a sword of sorrow in the hour of your bitter passion. Through you, O Christ, Savior of the world, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost lives and reigns, world without end. Amen. And we pray that in the suffering of Jesus, we may find the salvation we need, we seek, and we hope for God's blessings in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's take a look here. Um, I do want to give a special focus. Joe, I see you've got a, a pretty good uh, deep theological question already, but I want to do a focus tonight, as I indicated, on um, Kyrgyzstan, my trip to uh, visit Father Tony Corcoran and his work as the Apostolic Administrator of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, some of the parishioners of St. Monica who are with us uh, may remember him. He came, oh gosh, this would have been about two years ago, maybe even three now, uh, three years ago he came and uh, our mission collection that year and in the years subsequent have always been for the work he does in Kyrgyzstan. And so it had always been my hope to go back. I visited him in uh, December of 2017 and he had then come in November of 2018. We kind of had some difficulty in 2019, then 2020 became COVID and 2021. So I was finally able to return uh, this past August, uh, just over a month ago now. And I went along, I wanted, the, the original goal, the original hope had been to bring a group of parishioners like uh, like other parishes do on mission trips and whatnot, not necessarily for like a, a specific activity to build something or to to do something, but really just to come to know the place and to come to know the mi the ministry that Father Tony is is leading and enlivening there along with his, his Jesuit colleagues and a number of religious sisters. But uh, it wasn't it just wasn't going to work out to be able to bring parishioners. Uh, this time, primarily COVID was was the big culprit. But I did travel with my younger brother, Michael. Some of you have met him around uh, uh, the parish. Uh, on occasion, he comes, brings my mother. Uh, and then a mutual friend of ours, uh, uh, Daniel Schmidt. Dan Schmidt used to, uh, they both, my bro brother and Dan, used to work at the Bradley Foundation. Dan, before that, worked at Marquette University. And so it was an opportunity for them to kind of see a part of the world that they never would have thought of going to and for me to go back and to see more my first visit in 2017 uh, we just stayed in bishkek the capital of kyrgyzstan and in that uh, in that visit uh we we saw the beginnings of the, obviously it focused a lot on the installation of father corcoran as the apostolic administrator that was the key thing so there were bishops from all around the region the other surrounding countries and the jesuits that yeah, he has worked with and who work in the country or in uh, the various places came as well and there was a beautiful celebration with uh, you know so many of the catholics in the community around bishkek and so that was great but so this time we did a lot more um, you know, kind of, if you followed on Facebook and Twitter, you saw, I tried to post some pictures every day, just little basic ones of the different places we visited. Um, we got in bright and early on a Tuesday morning. And in that process, uh, you know, we, we pretty much headed off right away, a uh, little time to go to 
the hotel we were going to stay at the first night, but a little time then to just turn things around and head out to the parishes surrounding Bishkek, um, two in particular. And there, you know, we just, one of the amazing things, and as you post questions, uh, you know, please feel free to post questions. But as, one of the amazing things was kind of how their notion of the parish develops. Uh, the small places, sometimes there, there are some parishes in the country uh, spread throughout. It's, it's about, let's do a little geography. So Kyrgyzstan is almost exactly on the other side of the world. It is, uh, when we're not in daylight savings time, it is 12 time zones away. So it's the exact other side of the world. It is, in terms of north-south, it's at the same latitude. Milwaukee and Bishkek, the capital, are at about the same latitude. Now, Bishkek is at the northern edge of the country, and obviously Milwaukee is at the southern edge of the state. But the square mileage of the country is about the same as the state of Wisconsin. And the population is also about the same as the state of Wisconsin. And it's spread through uh, about three primary cities, uh, and then a lot of just rural uh, farmland areas, small villages, things like that. So we started, obviously, in Bishkek in the north. The, it was August, so it was warm, uh, but we're up in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains. And so there's beautiful scenery if you ever, you, you Google Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, and they'll often show you pictures where you see kind of this downtown uh, square, kind of where the government buildings are, but they always kind of set it with the Himalayan, snow-covered Himalayans in the background. So it is good uh, to kind of get that sense. So it's uh, about the same climate as Wisconsin, the same terrain in many ways, other than the mountains in, the, in that eastern portion. But, uh, you know, it, it's just, you're, you're not in a, you know, a, a truly Asian, what we think of as Asian with a lot of seafood and water. You're not like in Africa where it's just, just so, such a different, uh, you know, when I was in Uganda a few years ago, such a different climate, different temperatures and things like that. It was, you know, it was this, a lot of it seemed the same. Obviously, though, a second or third world country, depending on what city you're in or things like that. Well, so we would, we made our travel the first day about an hour outside the city. And when they, when the priests there and the community there finds an opportunity to, to come back, really, after, you know, some of these places haven't seen a priest visit for 50, 60, 70 years. And when they come back, word will spread and they'll start establishing a place, usually someone's home. Someone of, you know, some has some extra space. And at first, just in their living room is where they'll gather for prayer. They'll gather to celebrate the mass. They'll gather uh, for catechesis as necessary. Uh, often, if the homeowner, uh, it seems that if the homeowner becomes uh, an empty nester, as we would say, they might even then just give over a room in their home, uh, the, a living room, a gathering space in their home to the parish, to the church, so that they, it can be a stable place. And then at a certain point in one of the cities we were in, the, they eventually, you know, the, the parish or the church actually bought the house or the house was given to them. So then they can make a, a room where the priest might stay if he's there for an extended few days. They can make a space where there's an office. They can use the kitchen to, to prepare, you know, a celebratory meal after some sort of event. And then they'll often then buy a neighboring piece of property so that there's more courtyard space and maybe a space in the future where some of the nuns who come and work there can stay. And that's how they've kind of grown some of the, the space, they, you know, almost like a compound. Um, you know, they'll gather in uh, when we were in Osh and Jalalabad in the south, you know, the parish in the south has really just, they've kind of purchased and gathered together a number of houses and their properties, and they use it for different things, classrooms and catechetical spaces, and obviously a worship space and sacristy and things like that. So it's, it's really uh, kind of this progress through just meeting intermittently in someone's home, then having a fixed place in someone's home, then having the home become the, you know, a church, a chapel, and maybe that becoming a parish, and then 
that parish, you know, trying to accumulate some of the property around it so that they can grow and offer more programs. So we, on our first day, visited two of these places that were just small, tiny communities. Uh, it's, you know, the priest can use a car and drive out there, but the, you know, the Catholics, it's, it's often too far. It's, you know, an hour and a half, two hours of drive just in the, in the environs of the capital city and even more extensive trips and travel elsewhere in the country. Then, uh, so we did that for the first day and really kind of just met a lot of great people. The next day we, we took off, we left again and we actually took a, a domestic flight in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan and we flew to the south. You, you might remember I showed some pictures out the window of the plane that I was that we were in of the different terrains and how just in this space of a, you know a couple hundred miles you know not really even going it would be like just crossing the state of Wisconsin but we flew you know as if we were flowing here to lacrosse but we in each space to drive it would have taken 10 hours because of the mountain roads and the, the lack of highway system. So we flew from the capital, Bishkek, the biggest city in the country, to Osh, the second largest city in the country and a city in the south. And from there, we drove about two hours, two and a half hours to Jalalabad, uh, which we had to kind of go around uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, it used to be when these were Soviet republics, you could cross those, you know, those republic borders very easily. Now they're independent nations. And so, uh, especially during COVID, uh, especially, especially foreigners are not allowed to cross the borders very easily at all. And certainly we were not going to, to risk that. So we had to drive around kind of this extension of land into the Kyrgyzstan, uh, you know, republic. And to what would have been a 45 minute trip became a two and a half hour trip. Um, but then, uh, you, so we spent then a day and, and you know, two nights in, uh, or one night, an overnight in Jalalabad and there met some wonderful people. That's probably the most memorable part of the trip, meeting uh, the, the families there, meeting some of the sisters who are starting to work there, uh, meeting the, uh, the community and talking to them. Uh, we met some some children. We you saw some of the pictures of a young boy who was making his first Holy Communion, uh, and that was just wonderful. And it's he it's a boy with uh, his older brother and sister are right now in the care of the church. Um, to some terrible or challenging family issues, and they are in the care of the church right now, uh, having become Christian, having become Catholic. And uh, just, you know, interacting with them, always we needed a translator. I don't speak Russian. They don't really speak. They speak more Kyrgyz. Um, uh, and they, they certainly don't speak English. So uh, we always had a uh, father or one of the other workers at the churches to, to translate for us. And they were just wonderful in their, their simplicity and uh, their, their basic outlook on life. And they, uh, it was just so pleasing to, to have that encounter. And at one point, one of the neat little things was the, the older boy, a 13 year old boy asked to see a dollar bill, simple request. And my brother and uh, Dan and I look at each other and I pull out my wallet. I don't have a dollar bill. I had a 20, I had, I had Kyrgyz, you know, Kyrgyz money, but domes, doms, domes is what the, the Kyrgyz money is called. But uh, so I handed him a $20 bill, no problem. And like, he was just amazed. He was just amazed. And his little brother who made his first Holy Communion uh, wanted to see it. So he's holding it and, you know, we're kind of, he's chatting and then their sister holds it and another little boy holds it. And the little boy who had made his first communion earlier that day just kind of looked up and very innocently said, I never thought I would hold a dollar bill, an American dollar bill. And Father Tony uh, watching and just kind of interrupted him and said, well, you, you held something more special earlier today. And he knew he had been kind of like caught and he took a deep breath and he said, well, 
yes, I held Jesus, and that was very special. But I knew that would happen someday. This I never thought would happen. And so he had this basic, simple outlook on life, which was, which was really very endearing. I, you know, they want a good life, and, and they're, they're struggling and striving. And thank, thankfully, the sisters and the priests are taking care of them. Uh, the, the other families in this community are taking care of them. Um, so then we drove back to Ocean, saw the parish there. Again, they're looking to, to build and expand the parish. They have half of a home that is dedicated to the church. And eventually they hope to have the whole building, the whole home and some neighboring adjacent property so that, you know, this parish can grow. It's the second largest city. It's the only church that serves the area. There are now going to be some, a new group of, a new group of nuns, uh, mostly from Africa who are going to serve in the south of the country. And so Father Tony is looking forward to the contributions that they can make and uh, the, the different opportunities that, that they'll have. Uh, we flew back to the north, uh, for, you know, at the end of the, that day, you know, a full, you know, flew out, flew in on Wednesday morning, flew out on Thursday night. Uh, and then we're staying in Bishkek. And then the next morning, on uh, Friday morning, we had to drive, we had to, we wanted to drive out to the east of the country. And in the east of the country, not, not terribly far from the, the border with China, uh, is Lake Issacool. It's one of the largest lakes in Central Asia. Um, kind of it's known to be their Great Lakes region. And on the eastern side, the far side coming from Bishkek of Lake Issacool, the church owns a, a place where there's a camp. And there's a couple of dormitory buildings. There's uh, a wonderful opportunity for just kids who are in the city who would never have an opportunity to, to go to uh, a place as beautiful as this was. I mean, it's just, it's like summer camp back when we were kids. Um, and they'll come out for a week at a time. Throughout the summer, they do different type of focus programs. They'll have, some of the weeks are just for Catholic kids who are there to learn catechesis and to, to kind of enliven their faith. Some weeks, uh, I think that two weeks out of the summer, they have um, they have camps for handicapped children. And you, ha you have to understand in a country that is majority Muslim, uh, in a country that uh, is, is does not have a lot of health care infrastructure, you know, places and opportunities for handicapped children, cerebral palsy, other forms, uh, other other issues that become muscular and they can't walk, they're in wheelchairs or or things like that. Sometimes it's uh, it, it's developmental handicaps or challenges, things like that. But there just aren't these opportunities. So the Catholic Church offers this, and this is open to uh, to any child, uh, Christian, Muslim, uh, among the Christians, the Orthodox, or the Catholics, uh, or otherwise. And so it's a great, it's a beautiful moment and a beautiful opportunity. They have, uh, while we were there, they had one of the camp groups for that were handicapped children and their parents and caretakers. They had another group of uh, mostly Catholic young people who do foreign language. So they'll come and uh, the camp, the Catholic camp will provide uh, someone to work with. These were mostly teenagers. In this case, it was mostly teenage girls and they were learning French. They were doing a French immersion week. Um, they do this also for German and English uh, in the course uh, of, of the summer. I think or English for sure, maybe not German, but they'll do English and French. And uh, that's, that's an area where I think, you know, I'd love to get some of our college students, uh, you know, or early 20 somethings to, to go over for the summer and be, uh, you know, teach English, really just you speak to them and you slowly work with them. Uh, and in the process, you learn Russian or Kyrgyz, and uh, then you also set a great example of faith. Um, the, 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 the next type of camp that they have is actually this wonderful uh, tradition of astronomy. And it's an opportunity. It's, uh, there are some, actually two priests. Uh, I think one is an engineer by training. One is an astronomer by training. And they help teach, you know, Catholics, Orthodox and Muslim kids together about how 
faith and science are not in opposition to one another. They're not uh, in conflict with one another. And so it's another really just kind of moment of evangelization, uh, of teaching this and allowing the kids to, to come together. Uh, quite often, there's just not this interaction. The kids are much better than their parents, as is always the case. There's not this interaction between the, the Muslim kids and the Christian kids. So we were out at the camp uh, for, for a night and drove back. Uh, and then spent our final days in Bishkek and visiting the different aspects and the different work of Bishkek and the cathedral and uh, different things. So John uh, did post a, a question here. In what language does Father Tony celebrate Mass? So the official language, the national language of Kyrgyzstan is Russian. Remember, it used to be a Soviet republic. Uh, so it, it was under the Soviet Union until the fall of the Soviet Union. But the national language is still Russian. And so Tony actually went first to Russia in the late 1990s uh, to work when the Pope John Paul established two dioceses there. And he went to Novosibirsk in Siberia and was the uh, was a priest there and the vicar general there. And so he is he speaks fluent Russian, in fact, at a couple of places where uh, we were in the city, we were actually near the university and the, we were at a restaurant and the server wanted to, to speak English. They wanted to practice their English. They could tell we were English and here we were English speakers. But they would comment how good Tony's Russian was, that he has no accent. He, he has such command of the language um, that he, he speaks as if he were a native. And so, yeah, so it was actually interesting. Uh, most of the time I would follow the mass in the Missal and whenever I would do a part, I would do it in English and he would do the majority in uh, Russian. But at one time the mass one day was just going to be Father Tony, myself, uh, my brother, Michael, Dan, and I think one other person was with us. So he, he you know, said, well, we'll do mass in English. Well, he, it has been so long since he has celebrated exclusively Mass in English. He, he had some, some difficulty. And I could tell uh, those of you that have been around for about the last 15 years, they updated the English translation. Well, he would often revert to the, pre, uh, the, the, the previous translation of some of the kind of standard English prayers, you know, where we always say, now we're going back to when I say the Lord be with you and our response now is supposed to be and with your spirit. He, the equivalent, he would do the priest equivalent of in some circumstances where he'd like to say, and also with you. And so he would revert back to that because it's just been so long. Uh, since he has regularly celebrated the Mass in, in, uh, in English. He, he is an amazing, amazing, um, skilled uh, man. He, uh, he, you know, speaks obviously English, Russian. He grew up in, you know, middle, middle, middle of nowhere, I always say, uh, probably being disrespectful, middle of nowhere, Texas. He flew it in Spanish. Um, there was one day as we're driving uh, across, I forget where we were driving to, but we had uh, a religious sister in the car from uh, who had Italy, but you know, is originally a Peruvian who's learning Russian, doesn't speak it very well yet. Uh, us speaking English, the driver only spoke Russian. Um, and Father Tony was floating between helping this one, you know, teenage girl speak French and speak Russian and speak English and speak Spanish. And, and it's just amazing. I wish I had that level of skill with foreign languages, but it's truly, truly a gift. So uh, Mary asked, what were the items you brought over in the suitcases? <laughs> so we uh so we filled a number of suitcases this is a tradition or a, a process that i learned with uh saint eugene parish and going to uganda that we bring um, supplies as they need it or as we can over to them so we don't we had a really interesting variety of things um there were some things that father tony wanted for the church the parish so we got, you know, whether from some of the donations or from, you know, old closets here at St. Monica or from priest friends of mine. Um, we got a few, you know, candle stands for the altar. We had six candle stands 
so that at three of their churches, they could have new candle stands. We brought, um, you know, followers, those things that go on the top of a candle, particularly a processional candle that help keep the wax together. And, it does, and these actually had kind of the glass uh, sconce to keep the wind from blowing them out so that they could have in the cathedral some processional candles. We brought vestments. Uh, we had a number of old vestments here at the parish. I, you know, with some of the donated resources, I purchased some vestments, some used vestments from the consignment area at, uh, at the religious goods stempers here in Milwaukee. And they wanted a variety of vestments, um, not necessarily because the country is in some sort of kind of specific uh, place theologically, but like one of the cities that when they got there and the community, like I said, may not have had a priest visit uh, for 40, 50, 60, 70 years. So there is one community where there is a significant, a significant, they found, you know, when I say significant, it's a dozen people. But some of these cities, that's all the, that's all the Catholics that, that there are. Uh, who only remember the old Tridentine Mass, what we call the extraordinary form now. And so he asked for some of the traditional vestments because in that church, they're going to, from time to time, celebrate the Mass in the extraordinary form, particularly for these elderly people, uh, you know, who, who just, they don't, they don't know anything about a new Mass or a Vatican II Mass. So uh, we brought a number of vestments, both new and old. And uh, we brought him a, a cope, which we, which we use for, uh, instead of a chasuble, but we use it at benediction. We use it for baptisms, outside of mass, things like that. Um, we brought, you know, so there were a variety of things for, for the, the parishes, the churches. We brought a variety of things for him to use in catechesis. Um, the heaviest thing, a little bit of a challenge, were, were books or books he wanted he wanted specifically some catechisms of the catholic church in english to work with um in in both bishkek and osh where there you there are universities um they have it's more likely that some of the young people will want to be learning english and so what he wants to do is use something like a catechism of the catholic church for them to practice and learn english while at the same time further and deepening their understanding of the catholic faith so it's a, it's a neat little thing, but as you know, uh, I don't have one right here handy. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, especially the latest edition that we that, that I got a, a number of copies of, are not they're not lightweight. So those kind of were in there. We brought um, you know, and then other books for prayer books and things that again he could hand out to people who are learning English. And who are want to you know kind of they want to come to the church and learn things and and have that opportunity. The the next category were things for him to kind of use with and help um, you know help his parishioners. So you know uh, one of our parishioners you know wonderfully donated two of our parishioners wonderfully donated uh, boxes of toothbrushes toothbrushes for the parishioners and. Uh, so we got various, you know, we, this wasn't a, a medical mission and we actually had to be a little careful, um, you know, each one of the three of us going, you, you kind of wanted in case we were asked, you wanted to just say, no, that's for personal use. Now, I don't know if, you know, anybody would really, nobody actually stopped and asked us and they didn't search our, our luggage. We, you know, it happens though. So we had to, had to just be attentive to it. But, you know, we each had, um, you know, a 500 count, you know, Tylenol, and we each had a 500 count, you know, the, the, the Costco version of cold medicine and, uh, you know, of, of different simple things that a person could bring in. There's, you know, Tony was just worried that there would be um, a sense that we were bringing things in to sell them to, you know, as, as contraband. And so we had to be a little careful on that. Um, the last thing that we brought, which again, I learned from the Uganda trip. And when we were going out to the camp, I thought this would be good and they could use it at the different, uh, use some of the different parishes, a uh, bunch of soccer balls and kickballs and air pumps for them. Um, so that they, you know, the, the kids, 
again, you know, have some of these things and soccer is big and kickball is really simple, you know, the red inflatable ball. Uh, so we, we brought a bunch of those that they can use at the different parishes. A lot of times what they'll try to do in the cities, you know, green space is a, is a commodity. I mean, this is, you know, this is like being in a big city where all the lots are very small, all the homes, you know, are generally they're fenced in and you may have a small plot now in uh, Jalalabad or no, excuse me, outside of Bishkek, the place we were outside of Bishkek, they've kind of merged together, like I said, about four different properties and created a large, you know, and it has a, kind of a field area. It's not huge. It's not as big as we have at either one of these parishes, but it's an opportunity. They can play some kickball. They can play some, with a soccer ball. Uh, and so we, we brought that, and it's just a great thing. The kids, the kids love it and, and enjoy uh, the opportunity. Um, so all of those things that we brought uh, had the various, uh, you know, had various opportunities and various uses. We were, as as I said, we were, oh, the last thing, the last thing that we asked was something that he or the sisters or the other priests needed. And so when Tony comes in uh, November, and that's our plan, yeah, we're hoping he'll, we'll be able to work it out that he'll come to St. Monica in November in order to do the mission, the annual mission appeal that we always do. But um, he, I finally pressed him, I pressed him, and he, he only asked for two things. This is, this is an eminently humble man, you know. I, I said, do you want, you know, do you want something significant? Do you want this or that? I ended up, I, I had a, 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 a lightly used, not very old uh, laptop computer. We brought that for him. But what he asked for were he wanted Bic pens because he said you can't get good uh, Russian or Chinese pens. And so he just wanted the basic big pens. And he wanted, uh, he wanted Caro uh, corn syrup and pecans because he wanted to make pe pecan pie for the other, all the other priests. He's the only American um, among the priests. And, and not only is Tony American, he's a Texan. He's a Southerner. And so he wanted to make uh, pecan pie. And so we brought him the fixings for pecan pie. I had no idea how I would explain that uh, to, uh, a, you know, a customs agent. But, you know, I figured I'd find a way if it would be scriptural. If, if they did ask about that, the Lord would give me the words uh, to use at the time. Um, but, no, it was a great, it was a great thing. Thank you for asking, Mary. A lot of people, I think, Mary, you, you and uh, John donated one, a suitcase or two that we used, I think. Uh, a number of people did, and they, it was great to do. And a number of people were very generous with, with some cash or gift cards. You know, and some people gave me, like, a Target gift card so that I could go and get some of these, you know, different, the, you know, I said Costco probably picked up, you know, some of the, uh, you know, healthcare items, uh, you know, and, and toiletry things at, at Target as well. Uh, I think I got the pens at Target. Um, so things like that, so that, uh, you know, they have those, uh, you know, there are some things that they, they could get. Obviously, they're always concerned about saving the money and some things that they, they can't really get good quality. Um, you know, uh, they're, I mean, like I said, it's a Russian kind of influenced place. It's still in that sphere of influence, but uh, it's also the case that being within, you know, they border China, and so they'll get a lot of Chinese goods, but, you know, in, in my observation, which may be incomplete or unfair, is if we think, oh, Chinese, you know, the Chinese version of things are, you know, a cheap ripoff, uh, what, what they make and then give at least to these, you know, poor countries that border them is, e is, e is of even lesser quality than what we would see here in the United States. Um, so, yeah, you know, just like the toothbrushes, you know, uh, the, the, the Chinese made toothbrush, you know, we, it, would, it would last a, day, a few days, you know, and the bristles start falling out and things like that. So, you know, he wanted just simple things like that. Um, 
So how did Father how did Father Tony learn to speak Russian so well without an accent? Tanya, it, it primarily, and Tanya, I hope you're doing well. You've been in my prayers uh, the, these last few days. Uh, glad you're tuning in and kind of passing the time. Um, so the best thing I can say is he started learning Russian when he was in college. Father Tony went to college. Uh, first, he started attending Marion College in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Long story, a little bit of a long story about that, about how he just kind of wanted to find someplace other than uh, Central Texas or where is he. To, the, the way I would summarize it, you know, he can tell the story far better than I. He basically had a choice. He could go to Texas A&M like his whole family did, or he can go to, you know, a, a Catholic, a Catholic college or university. And so he ended up at uh, he, he ended up at Marion College in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, decided he wanted to consider priesthood. So he switched over. He entered our college seminary program in Milwaukee uh, and uh, switched to attending Marquette University. And yes, was open to a vocation and became enamored with the Jesuits. But while he was at Marquette in his junior year, he did a trip abroad. So this would have been probably about 1985 or six, he went to, he went to Russia. He, they visited St. Petersburg and probably Moscow. Um, but he went to Russia and that started his lifelong affinity, uh, you know, with, with, with Russia and his hope someday maybe to go back as a missionary. Um, you know, but he, uh, you know, he kind of thought he'd probably do missionary work in Latin America but had the opportunity, like I said, in the late 90s, after he had become a Jesuit, after he had been ordained, uh, Pope John Paul, uh, Pope St. John Paul, uh, established new two Catholic dioceses, one in the Asian portion of the old Soviet Union, one in the European portion of the old Soviet Union. And he didn't, he, he admits when he got there, he spoke it a little bit and did not speak it well, but after 20 plus years, he's He's learned to speak uh, to speak Russian and to speak it, like I said, very fluently without an accent. To the point where, yeah, the servers at the ho at the restaurants uh, compliment him on that and are surprised by it. Um, yeah. So, uh, Bobby, good to see you as well. Anybody else have any other questions? You know, I can I can keep blathering on for a while, but don't hesitate to post a question or two. You know, as I look ahead, as I said, Father Tony will come to Milwaukee, hopefully in November, and we he'll preach the masses some weekend here at St. Monica and make the pitch uh, for the annual Mission Cooperation Appeal. Uh, but I would love to continue the the growth um, uh, the the growth of a relationship. Uh, between our parish and the apostolic administration. Like I said, I'd love to have some college students who would go over and spend the summer or a few weeks as counselors at the camp. I would love to, in the south, after the sisters get established, maybe have some, you know, doctors and nurses and dentists from the parish to go and actually do a medical mission um, and, and just spend, you know, a week where they can offer some services and some basic uh, basic care or basic improved care for the parishioners or, or for the non-Catholics in, in the area. And third would be, you know, kind of a mission. Like I said, they, they build, they try to create these parish spaces, these church spaces by combining, uh, you know, properties and renovating buildings. So, you know, maybe like a, a week long Habitat for Humanity, uh, Habitat for the Church type of endeavor uh, would be an option too. So just want to plant those seeds and, you know, have you maybe share that with people you know that maybe in two years or three years, two years, ideally, uh, we could do that. Uh, Dashiell, uh, my good friend Dashiell, would I go back? Yes, I certainly would. I certainly would. Um, it was, a, you know, it's a long trip. There's no question about that. It's a, it's a long trip. We flew uh, from Chicago to Dubai, which is a 14 hour flight, uh, maybe a little more, and then another four and a half hours to, uh, from Dubai to Bishkek. Uh, so it's long to get there, but it's, it's really a wonderful place. So yes, I would go back. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, 
uh, I am guessing there aren't a lot of visitors to the country. Uh, so no, there's not. I, and again, that's more dictated by the distance. There are some European and uh, Australians who, who go uh, because it, two, two things. One, it's considered actually very safe. It, it, people hear anything with a stand and there was some issue. It does not border Afghanistan, but it's not far from Afghanistan. Um, and so there was some, you know, there were some questions and concerns uh, about, you know, an influx of immigrants, but that's really not, not the case. Um, but the U S state department considers it a very safe country, very safe in the city. You have the same things that typical with any city, but, I, you know, there's, I, I was more, I would be more concerned about theft or my safety sometimes when I'm walking, you know, taking the, the, the bus, you know, in Rome than I was walking around uh, the, the area of Bishkek that we stayed in, uh, that, that we were in. So, uh, so it's a very safe place. And because of the, the Himalayan mountain range in the east, there are some smaller mountain ranges that, that move through the, the west and the south. Uh, it is a place a lot of young people are going. It's kind of the new place to go and backpack for two, three months or, you know, to, to bike ride. Uh, in fact, when we were there, one of our last nights there at, uh, it, 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 I'll, I'll admit at the last night or two, we stayed a slight, at a slightly a more Western hotel. So it was a little, little more comfortable. They all spoke English, which was a little helpful. Um, but there was a group of people, you know, uh, there were a couple of Americans who were there to do a bike track, uh, essentially across the country. Um, and so there's a lot of that sort of thing right now. Um, and so no, it's not a lot, but it's, it's, it's growing. Obviously, it's always going to be dependent upon the uh, political stability. And as these things go, like I said, it is relatively politically stable. Uh, how was the food? Oh, Anita, you're always so wonderful asking about food because you, you are a great cook and provider of food. One of the things that is surprising, uh, was surprising to me, you know, and maybe I'm used to, I've been to India and I've been, uh, you know, to Uganda, to Africa. Uh, I've been to places where, yeah, the food, you're always never sure what it is. Well, like I said, Bishkek, the capital, and Milwaukee, same latitude. It is, you know, you know, Lake Issaquah, their Great Lakes region. The climate is very much like the Midwest or maybe probably more comparable to like Denver, I tell people. But so there and because it was a, a Soviet M, Soviet Republic and the Russians led the government, even though the Kyrgyz people were there, it is beef and chicken and if you know while 80 percent of the country is muslim and they don't eat pork all you have to do is go to a russian owned or a western oriented store or restaurant and you can get pork and so it's uh some potatoes a little more rice than potatoes as their starch but by and large it is you know you can go to a restaurant and you know uh, the kind of the 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 touristy or the things that serve uh, the, the international community, they'll always have kebabs. That's the big thing. That's the local fare, kebabs. Um, but you can, you know, you can find uh, pretty much any beef or chicken dish, uh, and, and it's very straightforward. Now, uh, someone saw pictures that I posted from the, uh, the market, the outdoor market, and so it is a little, little stark, you know, to see their, their manner of a butcher shop. Um, I had, you know, we had, we did have one problem, a little bit of a, of a food uh, irritation, let's just say, probably more from the water though. So you get what I mean. Um, but other than, other than that, um, it's, uh, you know, you know, you eat cooked food, you eat, bottle, drink bottled water, you'll be fine. So it's very, it's good food. It is, you know, they are, most of the Catholics, most of the Catholics are of uh, German, Polish, and Lithuanian descent. 
And so that's the, the that's the menu that they try to provide. Those are the historic traditional meals that they would provide. So it's very European in that regard. So it, it is good. Um, so uh, let's see, Elizabeth, do you have any impression of how people there see or think about the USA? You know, this was interesting to me. Like the, the children, um, I think it is so far away. It is far less inclined to have English speakers than most places I've ever been. Um, when we asked, like, you know, the 13-year-old boy, you know, would you, what do you want to do with your life? They mostly have a view that they'd want, you know, they'd want to go to Russia to become an engineer or they want to go to maybe, you know, Poland or Germany. Well, I, we asked, do you, do you ever want to go to the United States? And they just kind of had this blank look. They never thought of it as even a possibility. Um, so that was a little surprising to us. And partly because, they, you know, just kind of what's proximate to their experience, what's, you know, within the grasp of their aspirations. And really, they just don't think that way, these young people. Now, the two, the little boy who made his first communion and his friend, who's about a year younger, who will make his first communion later. Uh, one day I, I took my iPad out, one, that one evening we were there, I took my iPad out and pulled up uh, on YouTube you know, just some kids' videos. And I was amazed. The, the two things that they recognized, so I, I forget what I pulled up, but then the choices in the column uh, to, to the right, they recognized right away Tom and Jerry. I didn't think, I don't even think most American kids would recognize Tom and Jerry right now. And Minions, the Minions, uh, the, I think it's a Disney franchise, the little yellow fire hydrant things. Um, they, they recognized those. That was their sense. That was the kids. Now, the adults, at one time, so I'm there as, you know, this visiting pastor, and I want to try and come up with ways to increase the connection between the parishes, the, between the churches, our parish and their church, multiple churches and parishes there. And so I asked at uh, really our first day there, and, and so it was a first day rookie mistake type of thing. And so after we, we were there, not for mass, but we prayed the rosary and spent some time and then we're having some tea and socializing. And I just asked, you know, well, what's something you need for your church? And we're in this, this, I don't want to call it ramshackle, but you know, it's a very basic, it's someone gave over a room, the old living room, um, you know, it's just absolutely simple. They have an altar, they have a tabernacle, they have a few benches that, that, you know, some of the men of the parish made. And I asked them, well, what would be something you want? Thinking, you know, like I would, like a, a Western American, you know, an American pastor. Oh, let's sponsor them to have, you know, new candelabras, or let's get them a new altar, or, or this, that, or the other thing. And they just, they again, like the kids, they just looked at me blankly. And finally, a woman, one of the older babushkas, just said, "Well, we 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 have a priest, and we have the we have the Lord, meaning the Eucharist. What more do we need?" She was just kind of, a, she was not getting the question, and I didn't want to push it. I didn't want to seem that trite or that that superficial. Oh, don't you want something new and pretty? They just they they want to be able to live their faith. And so they need, you know, obviously it's priests and then obviously it's years uh, uh, under Soviet, you know, rule where they weren't allowed to or it wasn't allowed to grow very much. Um, so their impressions of the United States, at least the people I interacted with, mostly of then European descent, mostly, uh, uh, you know, the Christ certainly a Christian minority. Um, I think they had generally positive views of the United States. I think they see, you know, the support we give to the country in a positive way, partly because, well, Kyrgyzstan is not really very, you know, it's at this crossroads, which makes it absolutely important and underestimated by most of the world. Um, 
you have to remember, so to the north is Kazakhstan, which is still much more of a client state of, of Russia than any of the other Soviet unions, primarily because like the Russian space program is based there. You know, the only time you ever hear of Kazakhstan is when the Russians launch or land a, a Soyuz, Soyuz craft, uh, their, their space program. To the east is China. Okay, so now you've got two big power, you know, superpowers ostensibly and eyeing up, you know, all of the, the resources. I mean, this is a mineral rich country, um, but it's never been developed. And to the south, you know, essentially the western border and the southern border are all a series of the stands. Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, and the, the fear there is Islamist. 80, 80 to 85% of Kyrgyzstan are, are Muslims, but they are a very, very moderate, mild Muslim community. Uh, some of it is really just kind of enculturated over the centuries, not, not militant, not Islamist. They are concerned in the south of some, uh, some penetration. So there you have in this country, in this, this crossroads on the opposite side of the world, in the middle of nowhere, where you've got, you know, China, one of the world's great superpowers, Russia, one of the uh, former superpower or a superpower, however you want to phrase it, trying to reassert itself and keep control, and to the South Islam. And they are almost, there's almost a peace because everybody kind of watches everybody else. The Russians don't want more intervention by the Chinese. The Chinese don't want more intervention getting closer to their country of Islamists. And the Islamists, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to upset the Russians or the Chinese. So they're kind of caught in this area where some of their stability is based on the fact that everybody's right at their door and kind of hesitant to get too far into it. Um, I saw more Chinese influence and Chinese investment uh, when I was in Uganda than I do in a country that borders it. China's, you know, uh, Silk Road or the, you know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is really going more to the north and th through Kazakhstan uh, than it is. And now, you know, obviously the whole Afghanistan is drawing attention to the south. Um, so Kyrgyzstan remains this place. So uh, they, they appreciate that the Americans still have some presence. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, sometimes he listens, uh, he was uh, in the Air Force uh, and he was a, an engineer. And when, you know, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, they had a, they had an American presence in uh, this at, I think at Bishkek, maybe in the South, at one of the airports for, you know, American transit. And, you know, he just spoke highly of the Kyrgyz people and how welcoming they were and how appreciative they were. And the Kyrgyz people, according to Father, Father Tony, speak well of the Americans as being far more friendly, far nicer to them than, say, the Russian military, which still has some presence in the country. Um, so I think they have a generally positive impression of the, of the United States. So long, long answer to a, a fairly straightforward question. Any other questions? We have a few minutes left um, to, to uh, offer um, while some people are thinking and want to cram for another question. Uh, I do, you know, do give some thought. Be open in November when Father Tony comes. Uh, maybe give some thoughts someday. Maybe it's a place you'd want to, to travel with me to go see uh, and to, to visit, uh, to, to see the work that they do in, uh, uh, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and then uh, lastly, maybe some, you know, parish announcements, uh, the two parishes uh, still have a couple of places left on the pilgrimage to the Holy Land next March. So, uh, you know, take a look at that on the parish website uh, and you'll have seen some links uh, from my page. I uh, hope to see more virtual Narthics in the future. Uh, <laughs> thank you, John. Yeah, I'll get back into a pattern. Um, you know, we'd like to see it grow a little bit. Uh, you know, all of you are wonderful. Um, you know, but this is, yeah, good, good outreach. So we'll work on that again. I, my hope is to do it once a month, uh, once a month in the, in the coming months. And, 
as we, as we talk about things. So, all right, uh, Sarah, uh, good. How could we send a donation to Father Tony? You know, if you go through, and I'm going to look, I'm going to turn away here just to confirm this. But if you go to the St. Monica's webpage, and I gave the general description, um, uh, and go, if you go to the St. Monica's webpage and click on Give, you can choose a fund, and in the fund is one of the choices is Kyrgyzstan, second from the bottom, Kyrgyzstan Miscellaneous. So you can give through St. Monica Parish, uh, and we can, and that will be used either, you know, we used, we brought some of it over uh, and use some of it for, to get supplies, and then uh, some will be sent. Yeah, that'll what we that's what we funnel through the November mission collection through. So online giving, just go to St. Monica Parish, uh, St. Mon Saint Hyphen Monica dot org, and then under Give, there it'll switch you to a, a Parasoft uh, giving page, and you can then do a one-time gift through the internet. Uh, or you can send a check to the parish, just noting on there, send it to me, note a gift for Kyrgyzstan for Father Tony. So do we send mass stipends there for mass intentions? Not right now. Um, uh, right now, uh, that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about that. We don't have many surplus uh, anymore. Um, this is, you. some of you have heard, you know, we, we kind of only provide uh, the ones that people just want. They want to be at the Mass. They want to know. They want to see it in the bulletin. So we don't get many surplus uh, as much anymore. So uh, the hour did go very quickly. Uh, so, and I'm glad it was informative uh, and, and enjoyable. Uh, Eric Hafsus is there. Eric is one of the people who was an impetus in uh, Eric. I don't know if you were here for the opening prayer. We did uh, one of the prayers from the Chaplet of the Seven Sorrows of Mary, and I told everybody about the uh, prayer pages on the website to go through the stained glass windows. So Eric was one of the movers and shakers to make that happen. So, I uh, Unless anybody can post a question real quick, I'm just going to double check to make sure I don't have any by private message or by email. Uh, we can then take a moment of prayer, uh, but, uh, you know, before we finish, see you at Mass. Uh, if you're interested in the uh, Holy Land pilgrimage, a couple of spots left, as I said, and... Uh, Let's see, with those of you that are at St. Monica, pretty soon we're gonna have the full swing of the capital campaign. So hopefully you'll give some good thought, good prayer to that. So, all right, well, let's take a moment and offer uh, a prayer to finish our time together. And since this is a feast of Our Lady, let us offer the Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May the Lord give you and your family all the blessings you need in this fall season. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Take care.